And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Well, you know, I have some good news for you. Those of you who just were so generous in, in giving to uh, our Children's Home Project, you know, we have this uh, every year. Actually, you can do it all year around. Uh, I mean, you know, because we're going to, there's so many needs out there at the Children's Home. But I want to thank you for giving because, you know, last year we were, boy, <laughs> we didn't quite meet our goals, but this year, We've actually gone over a bit, and that was just, that was such good news. Uh, I know so many of you are hurting yourselves. You don't have jobs, uh, you know, your your own Social Security, and you you have your own needs, and I realize this was a sacrifice, but, I I mean, thank you so much. You know, I've asked uh, Wanda to come on uh, the air with me uh, today. She's busy back in her office. She didn't let me pull her out of that office. She's burrowed back in there just working away. You know, she's uh, really my confidant, my assistant here, and oversees the management of this ministry. Uh, but Wanda, welcome to Power of Prophecy. Well, thank you, sweetheart. It's sure good to be here today. Yeah, it's good. It's good to see you. You're sitting <laughs> right there. Your bright smile yeah. wakes me up. Makes you, me feel good. You and Jerry don't like anybody in this man cave very often, <laughs> so I'm glad that I was invited to be in here. Yeah, yeah Jerry's over there too. He's smiling big. <laughs> well, you know, I, I wanted you to come in because this project, this children's home project, is, is really, you know, sort of your baby, I guess. Right, right, uh-huh. it is. Uh-huh. Well, it wasn't, when did it really begin? And We have been doing this 10 years. Hmm. This is our 10th year. 10 years. To do this. And at first, the kids were so surprised, <laughs> and so were the house parents. You know, we give to the ha- house parents equally, mm-hmm. and we got letters of thank you from them saying, we have never had anyone give us a gift before. Wow. And it just meant so much to the house parents because, you know, they sacrificed to work there also. It's a ministry, isn't it? It's a for ministry them. for them. And they were able to buy themselves a camera, and they've taken pictures of the kids now and send to us. But I I just felt so good about giving to the house parents Hmm. as well as to the kids. So now the the kids are all, they all expect it now. They're really (laughs) excited about it. And it it makes us feel good to be the conduit to be able to give it, pass it on from all of you good people that give, this is, it just means so much to Tex and I for you to give to the children's home. Well, you know, these kids, uh, every year we get back little cards. Oh, they all them. write a thank you note. Mm-hmm. They do. <laughs> and they're so nice. And uh, mm-hmm. now you were telling me that one right. little boy. <laughs> well, okay. At Christmas time, they get the their money and a lot of them will buy a gift for someone else or they say, quote, I will buy something I've been wanting Uh that I couldn't get otherwise. Uh, And so, and then one little girl, I remember a couple of years ago, she wrote and said, uh, I, uh, she either tore her coat or, or she lost it. I don't remember. And the money came in just in time that she could go and buy a new coat. And she was so happy Mm. that she was able to do that. But what is wonderful is um, a couple years ago, I think about three years ago, was it, Jerry, that we started giving to the back to school? He's nodding yes. So about three years ago, Tex says, you know, I remember when I started school and I'd, I didn't have new clothes like the other kids had. Sometimes I did get a pair of shoes, <laughs> but... Um, he said, maybe we could start giving to uh, back to school. And I'm telling you what a blessing that has been to the kids. I don't know which they're more excited about, the Christmas gift 
or the back to school? What do you think, Jerry? I think it's back to school. It could very, it's a close call there because they, they love to get new clothes at school. And one little boy wrote and he said, uh, I'm so excited to have a new shirt and pants to wear the first day of school. Now the other kids are going to be jealous, he says. <laughs> and he says, uh, he's just so excited to have this, uh, new outfit, but he says, uh, it, it gives me so much confidence mm. to start the year off. Don't you think he's well, right about that? Oh, text? Absolutely. I, I, I'll tell you a quick little story. I don't want to go too far, but I remember when I was a kid, it was very, very cold. Didn't own a jacket or a coat or anything. And, uh, we would go, it's true. Uh, I'm not embarrassed to say it, but we would go down to the city dump and rummage there and look for clothes that somebody had thrown away that we could wear. And there was this beautiful sweater. It was a beautiful sweater. And somebody, of course, thrown away, somebody from that little town where I lived. And But it, it had a little tear right in the front, a little tear. I guess that's why I, they, they had thrown it away. But that tear didn't mean anything to me. I, I wore it. But when I went to school, I suddenly thought, you know, I wore it. And it, it was like a vest. It wasn't really a coat. It was a little sweater, a little vest sweater. And I kept thinking about what if that kid is in this school? He's about my size. What if he comes up to me at recess and says, I know that my mother and I threw that away because we didn't want it anymore. And you got it from the city dump you're wearing. I was so embarrassed. So I I, I went inside. I took it off. But as soon as school, you know, the the, the bell (laughs) rang to go home three o'clock or whatever, I, I put it on so I wouldn't freeze as I walked the mile or so back back home. And I recall those days, you know, sometimes I didn't have socks either. And it was wintertime and I'd pull my pants down as far as I could to hide the fact that I didn't have on socks. So anyway, those are kind of things that happened to me. I that were know. very embarrassing. And I, and I, and I, I, don't, I would hate for them to happen to these kids. Right. Anything we can do to help others. I, I want to do that to help mm. these kids. And, but uh, they're so appreciative. And uh, they are excited, and they look forward to it. But they do send us thank yous, and and they're just so appreciative of this. And uh, some people give you a round text, not mm-hmm. just uh, at Christmas time. Yeah. So wh- that's how we came up with the idea, you know, to give for the back to school. And we also give to the uh, graduating seniors. Mm-hmm. that are there, those that are going on to college, we give a gift to them. So anyone that wants to continue uh, to give, you know, in the summertime or whenever they want to give, oh, we'll we keep it in a separate, separate fund. Mm-hmm. We do. We keep it in, and we tally it up every day when the when they do the mail, they tally it up, how much has come in for the children's home, and we keep it in a separate fund so that it can be dispersed to these children and the house parents and i just want to thank the people because i know some of you do give two or three times a year Mm -hmm. and uh, it's appreciated and we know that some of you may be giving sacrificially to this project if so we just pray god will bless you abundantly for that oh he will and i'm sure He he will when we help the little children i think god will bless us I believe he will. And I want to reiterate again, as they all know, you know, I've said it so many times, but I want people to know for sure that we don't take one cent. Oh, no. Not uh-uh. one penny. It all, it all goes direct to the kids. And uh, so 10 years. Well, thank you, uh, Wanda, for coming in. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> all right. That was uh, Wanda Mars, my uh, sweet wife. And uh, I, I'm going to ask her to come in. You know, she doesn't like the public, you know, the shining light on her, but. I think she deserves it. She started this project, and so many of you have contributed. So I want to thank all of you, and it, it means uh, the world. So, okay, we got a big program today. We're going to talk about, well, we're going from orphans to Zionist puppets <laughs> today, all in one big leap. Zionist puppets for president. Zionist puppets for president. You know, I was recently reading about a, uh, oh, I don't know, you call it a festival or a, 
I don't know, some kind of a meeting or conference of Republicans down in Las Vegas. Naturally, they go to Las Vegas, have a little <clears throat> whatever on the fun on the side, I guess they'd call it. And I was reading about it, and this rich Jewish billionaire that held it for Republican candidates running for president. Now, this was back in April, and, you know, they're already, well, they're getting charged up. And <laughs> I, I counted at least, I think, about 13 candidates for president. 13 already. Now, over on the Democrat side, there's, of course, Hillary. She runs every, uh, every time. She's going to run again, it looks like. Then there's uh, Senator Webb uh, from Virginia. He's a Democrat. Hey, there's uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Some people are saying she's going to run. She's a liberal Democrat. It, it, she's a lily white New Englander who claims to be a Native American Indian. <laughs> Have that heritage. I guess you get a few political votes by claiming that. You know, that you're Indian when you're really just a, another white person, I guess. So uh, anyway, that that's on the Democrat side. But on the Republican side, I've always been interested in the Republicans because they claim to be conservative. They claim to be America first. But really, are they? Uh, or are they all a bunch of Israel puppets, Jewish puppets? Well, you know, who, who am I talking about here? Well, there's old Jeb Bush. <laughs> Uh, I'm not talking about Johnny Rebel now. Uh, this is another Bush of the Bush dynasty, Jeb Bush. Then there's, uh, of course, Mike Huckabee of Arkansas, former governor. There's Rick Santorum, former senator of Pennsylvania. Marco Rubio, of course, of Florida. Ted Cruz, right here in Texas. Senator, and then there's Senator Rand Paul, son of Ron Paul. We don't get the two confused. They're quite different people. Rand Paul. Then there's John Kasich. He used to be uh, on the finance uh, committee of the House, but now he's governor of Ohio. There's Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin. And then there's my own governor, Rick Perry. <laughs> Rick Dancing Boy Perry. <laughs> we'll tell you about that in a minute. Carly Fiorina. I think she was with Hewlett Packard. She's the only non political kind running for office. That's why she'll never make it, most probably. Sarah Palin may run again, but I doubt it. Then there's uh, Chris Christie, the big man from uh, New Jersey. They say he's going to uh, run. Now, all these characters are, I mean, they're, they're a strange crew, aren't they? Now, you may like one or another of these people. You may, you know, enjoy hearing them speak, or you may have gone to some group meeting they were at and, you got all enamored with them and everything. And I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about these candidates and what they really stand for. And, well, <laughs> now I'll, I'll, let me, first of all, tell you my views. I'm not Republican or Democrat, but it bothers me. You know, the Democrats, they don't, you know, I mean, they lie a lot, like, like all politicians do. But you can pretty well trust them to be what they are, which is a bunch of crazy leftist liberals. Let me just say that right up front. But we we can dismiss them right away. They're, I mean, they're, they're far out lefties. You know, socialists, communists, the whole bit. But but the, the conservatives, the so-called conservatives of the Republican Party, sort of fascinate me because they're such fakes. They're so, you know, so fakey. And I like to, I like to bar barrow in on these. I mean, I mean, I just, I, I like to just get a, you know, a steam shovel and just shovel them all in some big old pit somewhere. I really wouldn't do that. But anyway, <laughs> I, I mean, these guys are such fakes. They're, they're, they're incredible. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about them. Now, first of all, I, I, when I did my study on these people, I looked in vain for any ties to the Palestinians. I wondered if any of these people were pro-Palestinian. But alas, I found out that all are very hardcore Zionist. They're all for the Jews, but nobody is for the poor Palestinians. Hmm. And I believe they've all visited more than once to Israel. But when they were there, they didn't visit any of the areas where the Palestinians resided. I thought that was sort of odd. I mean, why didn't they go where all the bombed out areas were and all the sewage systems are broken down and, you know, from Israeli bombing and 
where all the houses are uh, torn apart by bulldozers of Israel. And why didn't they go into those areas? Why didn't, what, didn't they want to talk to the Palestinians, get their views? Well, no. They were led around by the noses, by the Israeli politicians. And uh, then they were taken to the Holocaust Museum. That was a, a must-have visit. And, of course, then they were all taken by this little bearded, you know, black-suited Jewish rabbi to the Wailing Wall. And they all wore their little black skull cap, the Yarmulka. <laughs> and they had their obligatory pictures taken so they could send them home to the press so that all the Jewish publications in America could know that they actually visited the Wailing Wall. Now I have a collection of Wailing Wall photos. I think I'm just going to do a book one time, just call it The Wailing Wall. It's going to be a picture of all of these yokels at the Wailing Wall with their Yarmulkas, from Rand Paul to Rick Santorum to Mike Huckabee, Sarah Palin, every one of them with these Yarmulkas on. And I, I think it'd really be funny to have that. Now, they don't even know what the Wailing Wall is, but it makes me want to wail a lot. I mean, <laughs> I must tell you, I wail a lot when I see these pictures. And I'm thinking, do they really know what's going on? What, what, are they, what is the skull cap? What is, what is the meaning for that? Well, I know. You know, I've studied uh, the Jewish religion. I understand what it means. Now, remember, Jesus Christ was crucified at Golgotha. What is Golgotha? That's the skull. In Hebrew, that means the place of the skull. That's right. He had to drag his cross, his own cross, to the place of the skull. And so the Jews enjoy wearing their skull cap. It reminds them of their crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. So when Bill Clinton or Hillary or, you know, Jeb Bush or one of these jackals wears the Yarmulka, the skull cap, they're insulting our Lord and Savior. Now the Jews also wear the skull cap for another reason. They believe it protects them from the spirits. They think that Jews are always being bombarded with evil spirits. And they must protect their heads. Because that's where the spirits come in at, in the heads. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I don't worry about evil spirits myself because I have Jesus Christ in my heart. He protects me. They want to stay away from me. I don't think the evil spirits like Tex Mars. They probably don't like you either. But I suspect they do love the Jews. <laughs> no doubt. No, <laughs> no doubt about that. I get a little tickled sometimes when I'm talking about these subjects. But think about that. What an insult to these candidates that wear these skull caps. Now, while they're there, they also write a little pledge out. You got to write something on a piece of paper. You actually take it with you. Now, what it is, it's, it's what you're praying for. You write your prayer down on a little piece of paper. And while you're there, you know, at the wailing wall, facing the wailing wall, being watched very carefully by this Jewish rabbi who's right there with you at arm's length with these photographers taking the photographs. <laughs> not very private. It's not, not what Jesus said, you know, go to your prayer closets when you pray. There you are, the whole world will see you. They're taking pictures of you. Then you take your little, you know, your written prayer request and stick it in the crack among the stones in the wall. They all do that, you know. And I, I understand that the Jewish rabbi takes it out and reads it, and he keeps them for his collection. So uh, I, I don't know what you're going to pray. Probably most of them pray for the peace of Jerusalem or uh, for Israel or some you know thing like, like that so they can impress their, <laughs> their host that they're really praying. Now, I, I never thought that Jesus required somebody to go to a special wall in Jerusalem where Jesus told the Jews, you are of your father, the devil. That's in Matthew 23, if you didn't know. And Jesus also said that Jerusalem and Israel would be left desolate, desolate until his return. Now, they're going to celebrate the revival in 1948 of this Jewish so-called eternal city, which Jesus made sure it was destroyed in 70 A.D., he said not one stone would be left on another. That's why I can assure you 
when the Jews tell you this wailing wall is all that's left of the great temple of Herod that sat right here on this site. Well, <laughs> that's not any temple that was on the temple of Herod because Jesus said every stone will be turned that, uh, over, one on top of another. Now, maybe they tried to rebuild the stone wall. Maybe they tried to rebuild the wall at one time or another, but this, this is not the original wall by any means. So that's a hoax and a fake. But I never knew that, that Jesus required Christians. These people claim to be Christians. I never thought that Jesus would require you to take a prayer all the way across the world, stick it in a crack in a wall. You see, I know for a fact that you can pray anywhere you're at. If you're washing dishes, you can pray. If you're driving a car, you can pray. Before bed, get down on your knees and pray. Lay in bed and pray. See, God wants you to talk to him, communicate with him. Let him know your problems, your concerns. Let him know you love him. To tell him you, you appreciate him being your friend, putting that hedge of protection around you and, and loving you. I mean, this is a communication between you and a friend. That's what Jesus told his disciples. He said, you're my friends. I like that. And I'm not going to go to some silly wall that was rebuilt that Jesus tore apart. And what are these people trying to do? They, they, they actually, they want to, some of them want to rebuild the temple that Jesus tore down. I mean, don't try to undo what Jesus has done. You're going to be in big trouble for that. <laughs> When Jesus did it, he did it right. Don't try to undo it. But these people, they all do it. All of this is for fakey public relations. That's all it is, folks. They should be ashamed of themselves, but I, I suppose they're, they're not. Now, <laughs> I want to tell you about, boy, this is a, well, this is the words out of Atlantic Magazine. You know, it's on all the newsstands from April, uh, let's see, April the 2nd edition. The feature article in Atlantic Magazine was the Sheldon Adelson suck-up fest. Boy, can they really name it? I, the Sheldon Adelson suck-up fest. Now, who is Sheldon Adelson? Sheldon Adelson is a billionaire. He's a billionaire. He supported, I believe, Newt Gingrich the last election. He gave him several million dollars campaign funds. Well, you know, the Supreme Court has now ruled that corporations can give any amount they want. They're not limited. Did you know that? Starbucks, Google, IBM, yeah, they can give any amount they want to politicians. Unlimited. That's what the Supreme Court says. And Adelson says he's got a $100 million war chest, and he's going to give it to the Republicans that favor Israel. Now, Adelson was born, I assume, in America. He's an American. But every morning when he wakes up, he says, I look to Israel and say, you know, what's good for Israel? What's good for Israel is good for America, according to these people. They put Israel first, and America comes, of course, second. So he wants to know, Sheldon Adelson wants to know, which of these Republican candidates would be best for Israel? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So they all go there, most of them do, so they can sort of wine and dine with these, not, not only with Adelson, but his rich Jewish friends. And he's got several dozen of them there at this big meeting they have. By the way, he flies them in his big uh, private jets from wherever they're at in the country. And then he you know, takes them to these lavish hotels. And, oh, they have, a, you know, oh, they have it made there. Now, let me just read you this article because I, I, don't, I don't want you to think that I'm overstating it. But now, who is Sheldon Adelson? He is, as I said, a Republican. Although he will give the Democrats too, he doesn't matter, you know. If they're for Israel, they get their big bucks. But he's a billionaire many times over. He probably has twenty, thirty, forty billion dollars of his own. He owns the Sands Casino in Las Vegas, and he owns other uh, casinos around the world, including in Red China, where he has his pals. But he had this meeting, and, and by the way, he's you know sponsor of this organization called. Let me get this right now. The Republican Jewish Coalition. The Republican Jewish Coalition. So let me read this to you. Now, the subtitle of the Sheldon Adelson Suckup Fest says, Republican, this is quote, 
Republican contenders prostrated, prostrated themselves for the casino mogul's favor, a vivid illustration of who owns the GOP. They prostrated themselves for the casino mogul's favor, and it was a vivid illustration of who owns the GOP. Now, this is Atlantic Monthly's words, not mine. Okay, let me read this article to you now. I think you're going to enjoy it. It says, one on Friday night in Las Vegas, Sheldon Adelson pulled up to his private airplane hangar in twin powder blue Maybach limousines. The second was for his bodyguards. Inside, the rich and right wing were gathered to hear from Jeb Bush, a private audience whose exclusivity seemed to signal the former Florida governor's privileged position in the suck-up contest. Three other Republican leaders, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, and Ohio Governor John Kasich, were on the public program of the event, which was a meeting of the Republican Jewish Coalition. But everybody knew what it was really about, impressing Adelson. Like the Daughters of King Lear or the cast of Mean Girls, each sought to outdo the others in the fawning. Christie told of his recent trip to Israel, which he noted is, quote, about the same size as New Jersey. Walker mentioned and bragged that he owns a menorah. Kasich dispensed with his pretense of speaking to the roomful of Republican Jews and addressed his remarks directly to Adelson. There was also a scotch tasting, a poker tournament, and a gala dinner featuring former Vice President Dick Cheney, who defended the National Security Agency, and of course, you know, the torture, I, I added those words in there, and railed against isolationism. <laughs> oh, boy. Alas for Walker Adelson, the chairman and CEO of Sands Corporation, owner of the casino resort, proprietor of a fortune valued at nearly $40 billion, and funder of many Republican causes, was not, you know, he goes on and on, you know, I could read you the rest of this, but let me, let me, let me go on, because you need to know who all was there. Um, let's see, Walker, Kasich, uh, Ted Cruz, uh, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, of course, was there. He'd be anywhere where the Jews were with money. Um, and by the way, Lindsey Graham uh, boasted, uh, he would say, quote, he said, quote, I would say that Sheldon has aligned himself with most Baptists in South Carolina, the state where I come from. Now, let me think about that, if he's right. Senator Lindsey Graham, who's, who's homosexual, is from South Carolina. And he says this rich casino mogul, gambling casino mogul, is aligned with most Baptists in South Carolina. They're all lovers of Israel. Oh, yes. Oh, it makes me want to just wail and wail, doesn't it? Uh, in any case, uh, <laughs> well, uh, enough about this incredible uh, love fest. Between the Jews, and there were. By the way, he wasn't the only uh, billionaire, millionaire Jew there. There were many, and they go to a number of meetings during the year. You may not know about this, but all of these Republicans go, and where they praise Israel, where they say we'll do anything for Israel, we'll defend Israel, and it seems that Israel is a saintly nation of godly men, and their prime minister is the chief angel of a chorus of lovely individuals. Oh boy. Well, I'll have more on these uh, strange people and what they stand for. And I want to ask the question, why aren't they America first rather than Israel first? When we return right here on Power of Prophecy. I'm Tex Mars. Stay with us, won't you? Hello, friends. I'm Tex Mars again. Do you have my incredible book, 
the conspiracy of the six-pointed star? I hope you do, because this is the one book you must have to truly understand the uh, Jewish Zionist plague on America. The Jewish Zionist plague on America. The Conspiracy of the Six-Pointed Star. It's a big book, bigger than most books, probably bigger than about three books that you have. It has a lot of pictures in it. And you'll discover things in here that, well, you just never knew before. Did you know that the Watergate, the Watergate scandal was authored by Republicans? Well, you didn't know that. Well, it's not true. <laughs> it was authored, of course, by Nixon, who's a Republican, and his staff. But it was pulled off, let's just say, by Jews. Woodward and Bernstein, both Jews, Yes, that's right. They were newsmen. They were Jewish newsmen. They were told to get Nixon. So it was really a Jewish way to get rid of Nixon. And, by the way, his vice president, Spiro T. Agnew, uh, as well. But there's more. Did you know that Israel is a Jewish state? It's, it's Think about that. A Jewish state. Now, Rand Paul says that we must support Israel because it's the only democracy in the Middle East. That's what all these clowns say. It's the only democracy in the Middle East. But wait, if you're not a Jew, you can't even hold office there. Is that, is that a democracy? What if you're a Muslim? What if you're a Buddhist? What if you're a Christian? You can't even own land. You can't even own land or run for office. Only the Jews. Is, is that a democracy? No, that's a theocracy. Rand Paul needs to get his terms right. Well, you'll find out how that happened. You see, Harry Truman tricked the Jews. He was paid by a Jewish spy named Abraham Feinberg. We know this from the FBI files. He was paid by a Jewish spy to recognize the new state of Israel in 1948. And he and his pal, the Soviet dictator, of Russia, Joseph Stalin, within two hours of each other, both of them recognized Israel in 1948. And Truman was given millions of dollars. They brought the money the Jews did to his campaign train. He had a train when he was running for president, and he took all their money in brown paper bags, no less. <laughs> but when they brought the paper for him to sign to make Israel a state, they had there that it was to be a Jewish state, and he took his pen and he lined out the word Jewish. They said, Mr. President, you made a mistake. This is a Jewish state. No, I didn't. <laughs> I never told you I would recognize the Jewish state. I only told you I would recognize the state of Israel, and that's what I've done, and it's going to stay this way. Well, the truth is that Harry Truman was blackballed from that day forward because he did not make Israel a Jewish state, but only a state like every other state in the United Nations. Well, in any case, that's a little interesting aside. That, those are the kind of stories you get in this book that you won't get anywhere else. And I'll tell you, it's very deeply researched. It's factual. I've never had anyone that came to me and said, there's something wrong here. There's an inaccuracy. And you won't because I've researched the book. And you need to have this book. Conspiracy of the Six-Pointed Star. Now, the book is, I think it's what, $25. Okay, $25. Please add $5 shipping and handling. And we'll get it right out to you. Conspiracy of the Six-Pointed Star. Order it today. I promise you, friends, you will not regret ordering this book. All you have to do is phone us toll-free, 1-800-234-234. 9673. Now you can go to our website, powerofprophecy.com or texmars.com. Or you can write to us at Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Now let's return to our regular program. We're talking about the Zionist puppets for office. Now, here it is, 2015, they're all out. Boy, they're 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 decking themselves in. You know, it's it's a it's a principle of American politics today that you've got to be a backer of Israel. 
And if you're not, they're going to do everything they can to destroy you. They, they have the media clout. They own the media. The Jews do. And you'll be destroyed if you don't support Israel. And you've got to make it clear that you back them 100%. And they've never done wrong. And they're, a, you know, <laughs> they were put there by God. They're the only democracy in the Middle East, blah, 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 blah. And then the media will back you. Now, Sarah Palin was chosen for vice president by Jews. In fact, there were two Jews. One of them was Dick Morris, the campaign guy. And they went and, and interviewed her and auditioned her before John McCain had ever even heard of her as governor of Alaska. She passed her test, and then they sent her on trips to Israel. She was on all kind of Israel talk shows and such, telling about her undying love and devotion to Israel. She went back to Alaska, and then suddenly one day she got a phone call from John McCain. He didn't even want her as vice president, but they told him, this is the one you've got to choose. So he did. That's how she got on the ticket. Now, even to this day, she wears a little pin. Go on uh, Google up uh, photos of Sarah Palin, you'll see the little pin she wears. It's, it's, it's two flags together, a little pin she wears on her clothes. One flag is the United States flag. The other side, or I should say, you know, on the same side, but side by side with each other, is the Israeli flag, the Star of David, so-called. Really, it's the hexagram of the witches. Right side by side with the United States flag. That, that's, that's her two flags. She's not America first. Well, now, let's just talk about some of these candidates. I want you to know about them. Now, if I know that they're also for immigration reform, meaning amnesty for all these illegal elements, I'll tell you that too. And they're all for war, by the way. Even Rand Paul, he's for war in the Middle East. If it'll help Israel, if it'll help protect <laughs> Israel that has 400 nuclear bombs, and I assure you, I think it's the fourth or fifth largest military force in the world. Well, nevertheless, it's under threat of <laughs> these poor Arabs. Now, Jeb Bush, let's just talk about him. His brother W was the biggest Zionist we had as president in the last, what, 100 years, I suppose. Think of all that W did for Israel. I mean, he attacked country after country, lying making up excuses why they needed to be attacked. He killed thousands of Americans, did it all for Israel. Thousands of Americans lost their limbs. Old George W. did it for America. Why, he hung Saddam Hussein. For who, America? No, Israel. Israel. Now, Jeb Bush is a big immigration backer. He thinks all of these illegal immigrants in America should be allowed to stay. He says if we allow them to stay, that would be, quote, an act of love. Huh? Well, that's, that's his words. He said the, the immigrants, illegal or not, should be allowed to stay because it's an act of love. He has no love for the Palestinians, the Iranians, or the Russians, but he loves the illegal immigrants. And it's an act of love, says Jeb Bush, to bring him in and keep them here. Now, he's married to a Mexican woman named Columba. I'm not kidding about this now. Jeb Bush is married to Columba, a Mexican woman. He has a son, and his son, let's see, what is his name now? George. Yeah, George, George Bush said. Now, his son, George, half Mexican, half Bush, just became the Texas land commissioner. He won political office. How did he win? Because the Bush dynasty sponsored him. Was he qualified? Well, of course not. He might have been qualified to be a, a dog catcher. I doubt it because dog catchers actually need some qualifications. But he certainly wasn't meant to be the Texas land commissioner, but he's in that office. He's married. Well, in any case, Jeb Bush. Maybe that's why. Maybe he thinks it's an act of love. He's showing his love for his Mexican wife or his Half Mexican son, George. Jeb Bush. Of course, Jeb says he will defend Israel with all the power that America has. That's right. Defend Israel. Back it up. Now there's Governor Mike Huckabee. 
Now, people like Mike Huckabee, sort of a likable guy, tells a lot of jokes. You know, he had his own TV program on Fox News Network. Mike Huckabee, he was the governor of Arkansas. Now, he's been a big backer of Israel ever, ever since the days when he started out as a Baptist preacher. He, he's, I guess he still is a pastor. He still has a license to preach. He's a Zionist. And on his TV show, he actually went to Israel. And he wore the Yarmulke there, the skull cap. And he broadcast his show while he was wearing the skull cap. And, and I saw him on TV there, and he was saying something like this. America should tell Israel how much we appreciate them. You know, said Governor Huckabee, God gave the title of this land to the Israel people over 3,000 years ago. You know, and I, I wrote that down when he said it. God gave the title of this land to Israel, to the people of Israel, over 3,000 years ago. Now, I wanted to see that title. He gave them the title, but I knew that they didn't really have a title. I couldn't write to Mike Huckabee and say, hey, Mike, send me a copy of that title, because there is no title. And they didn't, you know, <laughs> that land of Israel didn't even exist at the time. Now, God did give a piece of land to Abraham. He took him up on a hill and he overlooked it and he says, all the land that you can see is going to be yours and your people. Now, uh, who, who is his people? Well, didn't he have a slave wife? And didn't he, didn't he have a free wife? Well, who was the slave? And who was the free? What, did the slave's wife become Jews? Now, Abraham was not a Jew himself. See, things get real confusing when you actually read the Bible for yourself and don't make up stories, Mr. Huckabee. It says in the Bible that he basically is from the country that we call Iraq today. He was an Iraqi. He was from Ur, a city in the Chaldees, which is Iraq. And they worshiped the gods of Babylon there. And God took him out and took him out to the desert and, and, and gave him land and, you know, and took him out from there and and there's where, and then God said, I'm going to make you a father. This is a direct quote. I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Israel, no, many nations. In fact, Israel didn't even exist at the time. So when people said Abraham is the father of Israel, I said, well, really? Really? <laughs> but wait just a minute. He was the father of many nations. Name them. Uh, Israel and, uh, well, you can't name them, can you? You see where you get all confused? Abraham was the first patriarch of Israel. Really? Was he? Oh, my goodness gracious. In any case, by the way, it says in Galatians 3, verse 29, that if you belong to Jesus, if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Ah, it's a spiritual thing then. You become a spiritual seed of Abraham. What does that mean? You're his heir. Whatever God gave him is yours too. What did God give him? Let me, let me, <laughs> let me tell you the lovely inheritance of Abraham. It's in heaven. It's in heaven. It was Paul said that Abraham did not look to an earthly city, but to a heavenly. <laughs> he, did, he, didn't, he wasn't concerned was some earthly city named Jerusalem. It didn't even exist at that time. But he was very concerned with a heavenly, heavenly residence. See how you can get things so mixed up, friends? How is it that if I asked you, who are the seed of Abraham, you would say, many of you would say, oh, that's, uh, that's the Jews. Then I would say, are you a Christian? You, you might say, yes, I am. I would say, well, then you're the seed of Abraham. Oh, no, I'm not. Uh, no, I'm not. No, only the Jews. Okay, you know, the tongue is a mighty instrument, the Bible says. The tongue is a mighty instrument, and it can get you in a lot of trouble, friends. If you want to deny that you're of Christ Jesus, you can. You can deny it. Well, I am of Christ Jesus. I'm just not of Abraham. Well, it says there that if you're of Jesus, you are the seed of Abraham, and you're an heir according to the promise. What is that promise? Eternal life with Jesus in heaven. That's the promise. That's the promise because he didn't look to an earthly city, but to a heavenly. That's the promise. 
Why would anyone who has died and gone on to be with Lord Jesus, why would they look back to this earth? You know, Jerry, I, I don't understand that of people. Oh, no, the Jews, are gonna, they're going to have Israel forever. <laughs> hey, look, I love America. I do. I love the United States. I love Texas. This is my home. I've been all over this country, and I love every bit of it. North Carolina, California. There are a few states that I've been I even love Chicago. That's pretty <laughs> desperate when you love Chicago. But I love the, the place, and there's a lot of nice, beautiful places there, nice, lovely people. But when I leave this location, Earth, when I leave this planet, when I go on to heaven to be with my Lord Jesus, I'm not going to look back, friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't want to be a lot and look back. <laughs> of course, Lot really didn't look back. His wife did, right? I shouldn't have said that. His wife, she, she still thought about what she was missing. You know, and, and she turned around and, <laughs> and she became a pillar of salt. A pillar of salt. I one time read a story, and it was sort of a humorous story, but it had some good points to it, about this archaeologist that went to the Middle East, and he found hidden in a cave there a great statue of a beautiful woman. And he instantly recognized it as the statue of Lot's wife. It was a pillar of salt. It was a, a salt made of salt. And he thought it was so lovely. He said, I'm going to take it instantly to my uh, office and lock it up. Well, he lived about, you know, he had an institute of the museum about 60 miles from where he found the statue in the cave where it's, it's sat there for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, this salt statue. And he put it in the back of his truck and he took off down the road, he and his assistants. And it immediately began a huge rain. And before anything, they got out of the truck and they didn't know what to do. They, you know, there was nowhere where they they tried to put it in the cab of the truck and it wouldn't fit, and because it was a big statue. And finally, they just stood there as the salt just dissolved into nothingness. <sighs> there was Lot's wife, <laughs> a puddle of salt. <laughs> well, folks, <laughs> well, let's just Mike. Anyway, Mike Huckabee. He's, you know, the guy has read the Bible, but he must only read the Old Testament parts. You know, where, where it says that, you know, Abraham is a father of many nations. He doesn't know what nations that, you know, they were, but he, he thinks it's only Israel. But he doesn't know that, that, that Abraham didn't look to Israel at all. By the way, Mike Huckabee was uh, governor of Arkansas, where he also supported immigration reform. All these people, they try to tell you they're against amnesty and reform. But it's not true. They're all for all these illegal aliens. Now, Mike Huckabee says, I'm for security at the border. I, I, I'll secure the border as president. Baloney. George Bush didn't do it. Bill Clinton didn't do it. George W. didn't do it. Barack Obama didn't do it. And neither will Mike Huckabee or these other clowns. Mike Huckabee actually said, one, listen to this, folks. He was at a Republican Party meeting, and somebody asked him, Mr. Huckabee, as governor of Arkansas, why did you support legislation that was passed by your legislature that gave free tuition to illegal aliens? Now, I want you to get that. If you're an illegal alien in Arkansas, you not only did not get arrested, but you got to go to college free at a state-supported institution. Now, I found out about that, and I checked into it. Found out that in Arkansas, the people there have to pay tuition but not if you're an, an immigrant. You don't have to pay any tuition. It's free. And if you come from one of the other 49 states, you have to pay about three or four times as much as an Arkansas relative, uh, a resident. But if you're an illegal alien from Mexico, or, hey, Red China for that matter, you, you got to go to school free. And, and, and so Mike Huckabee was asked about that. He said, well, I just considered it my Christian duty to approve that bill. He considered it his Christian duty. Well, why didn't he? I mean, there are a lot of poor Texans or Arkansans or New Mexicans or Louisianans. Why didn't he approve it for them too? Well, I, I, it was just my Christian duty, which reminds me of Jeb Bush saying, it's an act of love. It's, oh, oh, boy. Now, Rick Santorum. Let's go to Rick Santorum. Senator from Pennsylvania. I understand he's checking into running again. He may run for president again. Now, he's a good Catholic boy. 
But did you know that when he became senator, the first thing that happened in his office was a Jewish agent appeared. In my files, I actually have the name of the Jewish agent. He appeared. He was, a, he was implanted in Rick Santorum's office by the, the Jews. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the Jewish ADL. They said that he needed a Jewish agent in his office to advise him on Jewish matters. Now, the Jews are only 2% of America's population. There are only 7 million Jews in Israel. There's only about 18 and a half million Jews in the whole world. Why did he need a Jewish agent to assist him? So he had a Jew in his office to assist him. That's nice. Now, Rick Santorum is an interesting man. And he says if he becomes president of the United States, first thing he's going to do is attack Iran because they threaten Israel. All these senators want to attack and others want to attack Iran because they're opposed to Israel. So they all want to get us into a big war, another war. They're all a bunch of warmongers. And they evidently have not read the Bible. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. But all these people say, blessed are the war makers. I want to make war. Now, Rick Santorum has criticized Ted Cruz. See, Ted Cruz was invited by Christians in 2014. He went to this Christian affair, Senator Ted Cruz did, and he got up on the stage, and the, the, the group was called In Defense of Christians. In Defense of Christians. Now, knew, Cruz knew what he was going to do there. You see, he did not like this Christian group, okay? Because they were opposed to those in the Middle East who were killing Christians. And boy, friends, that's true. So many Christians are being killed in the Middle East. I, I mean, there, there's a holy war going on by the uh, Arab terrorists. ISIS and the others against Christians. They're crucifying Christians. They're killing them. They're raping Christian wives. And it's happening to hundreds of thousands of Christians. They're burning churches down in Iraq, Syria, and other places. And so this group was founded called In Defense of Christians. Now the problem is, is that there, there, there's also attacks on Christians inside Israel. Get that? By the Jews inside Israel. Now, you want to wear a little cross on, you know, as a, uh, on your a little pin on your dress or on your suit? You want to wear a cross around your neck? Well, just go to old Jerusalem. Go to old Jerusalem, the old section, and see if some Jew doesn't come up and spit on you, assault you, Get in your face and scream and holler at you because you're wearing that cross because they hate the symbol of Jesus Christ who died willingly on the cross. They hate it and they'll hate you for it. This group called in defense of Christians is opposed to that kind of treatment of Christians. They're to defend Christians. So Cruz got up to this group and he had planned his remarks in advance. He was going to make points with the, with the Jews. I saw this on TV myself. And Cruz made a point to say he would not support groups in the Middle East who are not pro-Israel. Huh? Including Christian groups? That's right. I will not support groups in the Middle East who are not pro-Israel. He walked off the stage to a chorus of boos after telling the crowd he would not stand with them if they did not stand with Israel and the Jews. See, he was intentionally provoking this audience that he knew was not staunchly pro-Israel. Now, Rick Santorum rightly criticized Ted Cruz for this. He said, these are Christians that are, that are being tortured and murdered for their faith. He said, Cruz's comments are off. You, you've got to support persecuted Christians. He said, even though Christians don't agree with me on every issue, I will support any 
that are being persecuted. Well, good for you, Rick Santorum. I would go in and say something like, this is Rick Santorum's words, and I like these. He says, I'd go in and say something like, if you don't stand with Israel, you're wrong. And he would, you know, tell them what, you know, the reason why, blah, blah, blah. But I would also say that if you don't share that point with me, I'm not going to walk out on you. So Ted Cruz walked out on a Christian group because they didn't support Israel. Who does he stand with then? He stands with Israel against Christians. And that's a shame. By the way, Ted Cruz, who is he really? Sure, he's a Zionist, but he's a Harvard graduate. His wife is an employee of Goldman Sachs Bank. You know Goldman Sachs, the Jewish own bank. Now, Ted Cruz, no sooner had got elected to the Senate for the state of Texas, and he got with Senator McConnell, his pal, who's now the Senate Majority Leader, and they both traveled to Israel together. He wasn't even a, he hadn't even been sworn in a senator yet, but he flew on a private jet with Senator McConnell to visit Israel. What was he doing? Getting his marching orders? They were telling the guy what to do, what to say. In the two months before he attained office as senator, Ted Cruz visited twice on a private jet to Israel. Now, let's go to Rand Paul. Now, Ron Paul showed no favoritism. He was America first, and that was it. But Rand Paul favors Israel. He favors Israel. He says they're the only democracy in the Middle East. Well, Turkey is a democracy. So that's a lie right away. But second of all, of course, well, let's just, we're going to have to go fast here. Rand Paul, he said to the Associated Press, I am visited every day by Jews, by Jewish officials. He's visited every day. He was actually boasting of his ties with the Jews. The Jewish lobby is visiting him every day. Wow. Governor John Kasich, he was at the Sheldon Adelson con uh, conference in Las Vegas. He's pro banks. He was on the banking committee when he was a congressman. Now he's the governor of Ohio. He's pro immigration. Governor Walker, he bragged that he owns a Jewish menorah. I keep it in my home, he says. He was given $650,000 from Sheldon Adelson last year. It's the governor of Wisconsin. Rick Perry, governor of Texas. You know Rick Perry. He's for immigration reform too. Don't believe him when he says, I sent the National Guard down there, the, the Texas National Guard. He, listen to this. On the YouTube are two interesting videos. He danced twice. He danced with the rabbis, the Hatikva. He danced with the rabbis. Rick Perry dancing with the rabbis. Unbelievable. And there's more. Chris Christie, of course, went to the Adelson meeting and he bragged about his travel to Israel and on and on and on. All these people are Zionists. All of them are pro-war. All of them are anti-Palestinian. They're not America first. Rand Paul is probably the closest, but even he knows where his bread is buttered. Folks, the Jews have clout. They have the media. They have the money. They control the American political system. And if we want a president who's a Jew, doesn't matter what their blood is. They're the same as a Jew. Barack Obama says, I have a Jewish soul. I have a Jewish soul. Really? <sighs> this is Tex Mars, friends. You've been listening to Zionists for Puppets today. The real story of the Republicans running for president of the United States. I, there's a couple more here, Marco Rubio and others that I didn't get around to, but it all turns out to the same thing, doesn't it? I'm Tex Mars Friends, inviting you each week during the same time, tune in and discover the power of prophecy. Prophecy.